So um, this time, Ridu Pumri Valve replacement laid after Tetralogy of Fellow. And, and by the way, this is a much different group to the ROS group where you start off with a normal right ventricle. These, these patients have an abnormal right ventricle from the time that they're born. Um, we've now done 750 patients with adult congenital heart surgery at Royal Melbourne and Epworth. And uh, there's probably more than, than that because Marco Larabina, who you heard talk before, is um, um, in our service and uh, he's done quite a lot of these patients but also a lot of his own patients and uh, uh, in hurrying to get ready for this um, presentation I didn't include the additional ones that he had. But the point of the slide is really to show you that Tetralogy of Fellow is a big big group in the um, adult congenital heart practice. Um, ASD used to be the biggest group um, but Tetralogy of this is only big because of all the ones we did in the 90s uh, and as Greg showed the secundum ASDs are largely dealt with with the AMPLATs are but Tetralogy of Fellow is the next um, biggest group, nearly a quarter of the patients. And, and they're virtually all redo uh, surgeries. Um, uh, now, I did miss Yishay's talk this morning because the plane was delayed. And um, excuse me if I do cover some of the um, stuff that she talked about. Um, but the four things are the malalignment VSD, so that the outlet septum is, is malaligned to the, the regular ventricular septum anterior displacement uh, of the infundibular septum, which means they've got a smaller pulmonary outflow tract than, than the um, aortic. Uh, they have a, as a result of that, they have an overriding aorta, um, and they have significant right ventricular hypertrophy because the right ventricle is at systemic pressure because of the huge VSD. Now, those three are all fixed, but what is variable is where the pulmonary stenosis occurs, and it can be uh, it's usually in the infundibulum uh, and the pulmonary valve, but can also be in the, in the pulmonary arteries. So just to show that variability, here's a couple of angiographic slides uh, showing a pulmonary trunk that's about um, half the size of the aorta and, and one here that's uh, absolutely tiny uh, outflow tract. And it, it all depends on how anterior dis displaced that, that outflow septum is with the, um, um, the, the conotruncal development that we heard about from Marco earlier. Uh, usually the right ventricular outflow tract and the main pulmonary artery are in, in unison uh, and often the, the RPA and LPA are normal size. And uh, with the repair initially, and it's important to understand that so you can address the problems that occur later, this is looking through the right atrium um, and just bear in mind that the tricuspid valve is uh, in a dotted line. But here's the VSD and the aortic valves are right behind it. And the things you have to look out for apart from the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve is the conducting system, uh, which is running down here, usually on the inferior margin of the, of the VSD. Um, so to, to fix this thing up, you've got to patch that VSD and relieve the pulmonary stenosis at all levels. And of course, fix any additional defects. And um, there are often additional defects. Um, so as I mentioned, you've got to preserve those two valves and, and watch out for the conducting system. In particular, the bundle of his, which is sort of up here, and the right bundle, which is going along there. Um, as far as the relief of the pulmonary stenosis goes, it, it's usually a patch of autologous pericardium. And uh, as you see, it, it often has to go across the pulmonary valve. Now, we, we do try and minimise the amount that you cut down into the right ventricle because um, uh, that can lead to worse RV problems later on. But sometimes you have no choice. Uh, and you, as you can see, the patch is right across the uh, pulmonary valve. So basically, the, the pulmonary valve is incompetent from the time the operation is done. Um, and um, the right ventricle, in fact, in these patients has what I call a triple whammy. And they start off with severe RVH, um, then they have a, vent a variable ventriculotomy uh, down to the right ventricle, and they have severe pulmonary regurg, usually from the word go. But having said that, that is better than a valve replacement because it enables them to grow to adulthood, and the pulmonary valve is you know, perhaps the least important valve in the heart, and they seem to tolerate that very well. And, and I've seen some tolerate it till they're 40 or 50 years old. Uh, however, the, the right ventricle over time, and the, the usual interval is about 20 to 30 years, it, it doubles in size usually. The RV hypertrophy goes away, um, um, but if the pulmonary valve replacement is not performed in a timely fashion, they do develop late problems beyond 20 years. So they can get tricuspid regurg, which just compounds the, the uh, problems. RV failure with um, a peripheral edema and pleural effusions. Uh, late atrial arrhythmias and, and ventricular arrhythmias, which we've already heard talk from uh, Sylvia Chen. Um, so the late problems that require surgical intervention after TOF repair, um, I'm going to talk about pulmonary valve replacement, but there are other things that can occur. Residual pulmonary stenosis can, can still be there. 
They can have a residual VSD. They can have a, an outflow tract aneurysm because the patch that was used to relieve the uh, RV outflow tract obstruction can become aneurysmal. They can get aortic enlargement. We've heard Marco talk already about aneurysms in these patients. And they can have other uncorrected or overlooked um, problems. Um, here, for instance, is a patient who's had a uh, diffuse stenosis of the right pulmonary artery. And um, part of this could have been the fact that it was small to begin with, but also because the, um, uh, the shunt that they had done was a Waterston shunt, which was sort of about 40 years ago before they started doing Talsig Bing, sorry, Talsig um, um, shunts, um, uh, the, uh, sorry, Blaylock Talsig shunts. They, they did an anastomosis between the aorta and the right pulmonary artery, and that often distorted the right pulmonary artery. It says much smaller than the left side. And uh, this is the patient I operated on two or three weeks ago, and, and it's actually um, not an easy a problem to deal with because the aorta is right in front of it, and, and I actually find it's, it's, it's best dealt with by actually dividing the aorta and uh, putting a, a big autologous pericardial patch in there. And uh, then if you just close the aorta straight up around it, it'll tend to squash the the new repair, so I've often found it's a good idea to replace the um, mid-ascending aorta over that with a, with a Dacron graft that's a bit smaller size than previously. Um, uh, anomalous LAD arising off the right coronary occurs in about 3% of tetralogy patients, and um, that can be a problem because often the previous operation note from 30 or 40 years ago has been lost, and uh, you may have to sort of extend your incision into the outflow tract for the pulmonary valve replacement, and there's the potential for damage there. You might say, well, why not just go straight to a transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement um, uh, using the Melody valve, which we've already heard talk about. Uh, however, unfortunately, mostly in these patients, the annulus is too big um, and it's too, too elastic and flexible and you cannot get a valve to sit in there um, well. So we generally reserve the transcatheter PVR for the uh, second um, pulmonary valve replacement. Um, and I think we've now got centres in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne that are doing, doing the Melody valve. Um, so what are the options for pulmonary valve replacement? We've used both of these, either, either a pulmonary or aortic allograft. Uh, and by the way, I'd try to use a pulmonary. The aortics tend to become obstructed um, and become more heavily calcified than the pulmonaries. And these come from uh, three tissue banks. We have one in Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, there's a pulmonary. Um, the, the aortic one obviously has coronary arteries. And uh, we've, we've had a little bit of a lack of availability of these, and so for the last 10 years at uh, Royal Melbourne, we've actually been using the Freestyle. Um, it's a bioprosthetic valve, porcine valve. And uh, we've probably done equal amounts of both now. Um, and what I'd say is the pulmonary valve probably um, is, has a, can potentially have a longer durability, uh, and, um, but, but some of them will become regurgitant more prematurely than you'd think. The, the, the freestyle valve has a, do they develop an early gradient? So their gradients are higher, probably more like 15 millimetres of mercury versus five or 10 with the homograft, allograft, um, but they don't tend to develop pulmonary regurgitation like some of the, the allografts do. The indications for pulmonary valve replacement, um, and by the way, virtually all these patients, like I said, have severe pulmonary regurg. So some of them have symptoms, but it's actually a minority, um, only 20 to 40%. And mostly that's because they've had this problem ever since they were born and they really don't, rec it's a bit like an ASD, they don't really recognise that they are, have got a problem uh, because um, it's been such a gradual onset of uh, um, uh, sort of right ventricular enlargement. So the, the most common indication is in an asymptomatic patient who's found to have severe right ventricular enlargement or reduced contractility. And our guide is, um, this is using cardiac MRI, if their right ventricular end diastolic volume index is greater than 150 mils per square, square metre BSA, or if the right ventricle is um, more than double the size of the left ventricular uh, volume, um, once again on MRI. Um, so we can also have patients who've got a reduced right ventricular ejection fraction and there's no augmentation with exercise. If you have someone with severe PR and their ventricle RV is not yet dilated, but they're having ventricular arrhythmias, VT for instance, um, it's interesting that uh, some of these patients get a defibrillator, but we were, in the early days we did a lot of PVRs in these patients and they never needed a defibrillator. They didn't have any more ventricular arrhythmias after the um, a, a pulmonary valve replacement. And then there can be patients who've got a mixed um, pulmonary stenosis regurg um, problem. Oops. <laughs> um, Pre-op workup. So um, uh, we, we don't always need a catheter. We've talked about MRI, 
Uh, ECHO, obviously, um, but the catheter also does give, does give important information. Uh, here, for instance, so the, the, this is a right heart catheter I'm talking about, uh, showing a patient who has severe PR. We always, I always look at the RV pressure to make sure there isn't some additional uh, residual pulmonary stenosis. For instance, this patient here has um, an RV pressure of 60 and the PA pressure is only 25. Uh, so you know you're going to have to do something there, whether it be at the annulus level or the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, and and uh, not always will the trans thoracic echo show that well. Uh, the MRI will give good information there too. Uh, here's a patient who has a, an LPA stenosis where um, the RV pressure is 60. Um, there's a bit of pulmonary stenosis in the outflow tract, but there's additional further gradient into the, um, the, uh, the left pulmonary artery. And there again is that, that RPA stenosis I showed you before. Um, residual VSD, uh, mostly that will be picked up with an echo, but sometimes I've been caught out by uh, a transthoracic echo showing, oh, there's a pinhole residual VSD and then getting in there, doing a beating heart procedure and finding out that it's actually quite a substantial VSD. Um, uh, and uh, this, this is probably uh, an exaggerated case, but seeing a step up in, in oxygen saturation, um, we can actually measure a real QPQS and, and uh, see exactly what it is. Um, generally wouldn't see one that big after uh, um, if the echo hadn't shown something. Um, the preoperative CT, we've heard a bit of talk about this. Uh, here's, here's normal CTs and, uh, in normal patients and we don't tend to see those. Um, uh, the reason we do it is to ensure a safe stenotomy. Uh, sometimes it picks up other pathology like a left SVC. Um, the um, proximity, uh, we're really interested in the left denominate vein, the ascending aorta and the, and the right ventricle to the sternum. So this case that I did uh, recently has, the anominate vein is absolutely fine, it's well clear. However, the aorta is quite close. Um, you have to watch out for it there. You can see there's been a previous pulmonary valve replacement in that patient. Uh, the right ventricle is always close. We know we have to always look out for that. Um, and uh, just to show the difference between a normal CT where the aorta is right back here versus one of these where it's up here. And part of this is because their thymus glands often been removed in their initial surgery. Uh, also, their pericardium has been completely taken, um, so there's no pericar anterior pericardium anymore. And, and I must say, I have found um, the CT better than MRI, uh, purely just from, from the point of view of seeing the proximity of the aorta to the sternum. You, you don't get as good images of the sternum with the MRI. Uh, here's a patient uh, where this is going to be a real hazard. This is quite dangerous to reoperate on, on someone with aorta like this. Six centimetre diameter aorta. We've heard a bit about it from Marco. They really need femoral bypass. You've got to cool the patient down because almost certainly you're going to go into that aorta even if you're on bypass. Um, and uh, you've got to be prepared to control the bleeding if you make a hole in it. Um, and put your finger in to control it. If it's bigger than your finger, then you've got a problem with the, the hole you've made. Um, so, so we do these um, patients with pulmonary valve replacement with a heart beating unless they've got a and it's a big unless, um, some additional shunt, such as a PFO, ASD or VSD. And uh, that's where we can get caught out doing beating heart surgery because air can suck through the um, residual um, shunt. Um, mostly we've managed it with a single venous cannula and the aortic cross clamp is not used. And as I said, we've used either pulmonary allografts or porcine valves. And we'd probably expect a 20 year durability before their next um, procedure, which would hopefully be a valve in valve. And this is a reconstruction with, a, with the, um, a new pulmonary conduit and then some form, doesn't necessarily have to be that big an outflow tract patch, but it helps the flow of blood into the, um, the new pulmonary valve if you put um, a bit of an outflow tract augmentation patch. Um, if you look at the um, pulmonary valve replacements we've done with conduit insertion, uh, the last 25 years for tetralogy, there's been 100 and 54 uh, re-operations, three primary operations, and then um, also an additional number in the other congenital groups such as TGA, pulmonary atresia, intact septum, truncus, etc. So a total of 221 uh, added to 429 ROS procedures, 650 uh, right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduits with, with two early mortalities, um, one in the ROS group um, and one in a patient in the congenital group who had really severe um, uh, aortic valve endocarditis and uh, septic shock. 
So look, in conclusion, um, this is a brief summary and there's no mention of post-op care. But having said that, even though they're sometimes horrendous operations, they, they're usually young, fit patients. And if they, they get through the surgery, they, they do well. Uh, I haven't shown any late echo follow-up. Um, uh, redo PVR will be needed in virtually all tetralogy cases 20 to 30 years after initial surgery. Most patients have severe pulmonary regurgitation and are asymptomatic. And uh, you know, they, need, they need operation to prevent late problems with their right ventricle. Um, but, but these days I would say that the survival after tetralogy of fallow repair approaches um, uh, normal life expectancy. Um, the pre-op workup requires echo, cardiac MRI and CT, the latter being essential to ensure safe sternal re-entry. Uh, right heart cardiac cath remains useful to check the coronary anatomy and confirm valve gradients, outline the RPA and LPA and measure left to right shunts if they're still there. Uh, pulmonary valve replacement sets the patient up for a later valve and valve transcatheter valve. Thank you.